Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody uh, in the United States to Stephen. Good afternoon in Holland. Um, this is the uh, Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank uh, Zoom meeting to talk about the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and how it can build the USA today. Um, thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, this this um, Zoom session is being recorded, just to let you know. Uh, my name is Alfeka Mutardi. I am a, a macroeconomist with the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank. And my slides don't want to go. Oh, here we go. Let's try this. There we go. Um, and um, I'm with also with the Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank, and I advise on the economic impacts of a new National Infrastructure Bank for America to finance infrastructure. Again, thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, we have today a very special guest, Stephen Fenberg, who is an uh, Emmy Award winning author of this book, Unprecedented Power, which talks about the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, everything that it built to get us out of the Great Depression and win World, II, World War II. Very excited to have him here again today as our guest speaker. So without further ado, um, I would like to just start out by saying we have a proposal for a follow-on institution, a new national infrastructure bank. And I wanted to let you know where that um, proposal is right now. The bill in Congress that we have reintroduced is HR 4052. What it will do is create a $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. Why do we need one of those? because we can't do this through budgets, not the federal budget, not state and local budgets, even private capital money is not coming in to build our nation's infrastructure. Now we have a big backlog of things we need to fix. This National Infrastructure Bank will work alongside of budgets. It's an off budget public corporation. It'll top up all the financing that we need to fix everything. Currently we have 28 co-sponsors on this bill including the main sponsor, Rep. Danny Davis from Chicago, Illinois. And we're actively, actively seeking more members to come on to the bill because it's such a great idea. So uh, with, without further ado, I will turn the meeting over to Stephen to talk about the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and why we need it today, what the parallels are with, uh, in today's world. Stephen? Thank you, Alfaka. I'm so happy to be here. Our timing could not be better as we are talking about budgets. And uh, Alfeca and I have a an elegant, proven way to do so many things that our nation needs today that will not increase the debt or increase uh, taxpayers' burdens. A new reconstruction finance corporation, or let's call it a new infrastructure bank. And really, this should get bipartisan support, just like it did during the Great Depression and World War II. Uh, the RFC was started by a Republican president, Herbert Hoover, in 1932, when he realized the federal government was the only agency large enough and powerful enough to uh, stop the catastrophe of the Great Depression. So in 1932, he started the RFC to make loans to banks, insurance companies, and to hopefully get them back in business and restore confidence. Uh, it was a bipartisan board that he appointed. One of them was Jesse Jones. I'm his biographer and have the great privilege of telling his story. Uh, Jones was a Democrat, and he would later say that he gave Hoover great credit for starting the RFC. But he also said, and this is so relevant today as we grapple with the role of government in our lives now. He said, if the RFC had been started one or two years earlier and had judiciously loaned two to $3 billion, the worst of the Great Depression could have been avoided. Even so, he thought Hoover's RFC was entirely too timid and slow. When uh, Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated, he uh, made Jones the chairman of the RFC. Within five days, legislation was passed to uh, uh, implement the emergency banking bill. 
which allowed the RFC to buy preferred stock in banks. That was the first thing it did. It had to put a foundation under the economy. Now, let me just paint a picture so you'll understand what was going on then. Unemployment was 25%. Gross domestic product had been sliced in half and stocks on the exchanges had lost 75% of their value. People were eating grass to stay alive and burning their furniture to stay warm. It was a catastrophic time. And the federal government was the only agency large enough and powerful enough to address this calamity. So the first thing that the RFC did was to buy preferred stock in banks to recapitalize them so they could lend again, rather than just giving them loans that would put them further in debt. And the RFC is a great model for today. For instance, some of you may recall in 2008, the Troubled Asset Relief Program known as TARP. It duplicated what Jesse Jones and the RFC did in 1933. It copied them. It bought preferred stock in banks to recapitalize the failing banks in our nation in 2008. It saved the economic structure. And just like the RFC did in 1933, it made money for taxpayers on the rescue program. So the RFC was buying preferred stock in banks, recapitalizing banks so they could lend again because they realized that the frozen wheels of the economy couldn't turn unless there was credit supplied to the nation, to the businesses and to people. But the bankers were shell-shocked and they didn't want to lend the new fresh money. And Jesse Jones would get on, on the radio, not TV. They didn't have it back then. He'd get on the radio and he'd say, you know, you've got to lend this money. If you don't, the federal government will have to step in and be the lender of last resort. That's exactly what happened. The RFC, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, became the lender of last resort when the banks were either unable or unwilling to lend the money that was required to get the nation going again. And this is really when the RFC took off and many of its programs can be duplicated today to address our own daunting challenges. For instance, the RFC financed the development of high-speed trains across the nation. It built highways, tunnels, aqueducts, bridges. It created water systems for municipalities. I hope Flint, Michigan is listening. Uh, and irrigation systems for farmers. I think one of the most telling programs it did was to bring electricity to rural America when only 20% of the people living there had power. They were 80% were living in the dark. They didn't have a refrigerator, a radio, a fan. So the RFC collaborated with municipalities and utilities across the nation, and it also created electric co-ops to generate new power, but it also had to do a comprehensive rebuild of the grid so it could bring electricity to these remote areas. It was very successful. The trouble was that people in rural areas couldn't afford appliances. It was the Great Depression and they were strapped for cash. So the RFC, once again, they stepped in. This was a lending institution, not a spending institution, and that, is the differentiation that is so important to understand today. This is not about spending. This is about making judicious loans that were repaid. So the RFC stepped in again with another program to allow, let's say, the farmer and his or her family to go into an appliance store and buy a refrigerator, a pump, a radio, a fan. And the RFC would reimburse the merchant for those purchases. And the utility company selling the new power would put a little charge monthly into the consumer's bill with a little tiny bit of interest and forward the proceeds to the RFC. By the time the uh, program was disbanded in 1943 because it was no longer needed, Jesse Jones reported that over a million families had been helped through this program and also all the capital that had been invested in it was returned to the United States Treasury with a little bit of a profit. I bring up this example because this is 
the exact mechanism that could be used today to spread broadband access across the nation. It could help people retrofit their buildings and homes so they're storm resistant, energy efficient, and wired for the digital age at no cost to taxpayers and with no new federal debt. It could all be done through lending, just like it was done in 1933 to 1936. These programs worked. By 1936, after uh, FDR's first term in office, industrial output had doubled. Detroit was churning out more cars in 1936 than it had in 1929. Farm income quadrupled and unemployment dropped by 8%. Now, during this time, war is spreading through Europe and the United States is completely unprepared to participate. Uh, and Roosevelt knew that we need to do something to help, but because of neutrality acts that prevented the United States from supplying weapons to warring nations, and also even more public opposition, I think it was something like 80% of the public did not want anything to do with European conflicts unless the United States was directly attacked. So what was Roosevelt to do? By then, Jesse Jones and the RFC basically had their own power of the purse. It had been so enormously successful with its lending programs that it was also funding the spending programs like the uh, PWA and the WPA. The RFC was helping to finance the spending programs because it was so successful with its lending programs. And whenever Jesse Jones would give a speech and he was on the radio all the time in newspapers, magazines, front page on the uh, cover of Time Magazine twice, he would always recite three numbers. He would say how much the RFC had loaned, how much had been repaid, and how much it had to devote to the spending programs, which he wasn't all that much in favor of because he thought lending and credit was the way to get us out of the Great Depression. And indeed it did. I won't say it solved the Great Depression, but it stabilized and expanded the economy during the worst economic catastrophe in our history. Uh, just as I had cited, the, the figures that are proof that these programs worked. But anyway, back to the impending war, because the United States was completely unprepared. It's hard to believe in 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, the United States ranked 17th in the world in terms of the size of its military and equipment. We were unprepared, we could not help. But legislation was passed in June of 1940. And Roosevelt said to Jones, you introduce the legislation because if I do it, I'll get nothing but opposition. But Jones by then was so popular because of the success of the RFC. The RFC had made loans to every congressional district in the United States of America to help everybody get out of the throes of the Great Depression. So Jones went to Congress. He introduced this legislation. It was passed very quickly. And it allowed the RFC to buy or build anything required to fight World War II. So within a matter of months, the United States went from being 17th in size for the, of its military to basically being the arsenal of democracy. So the RFC, Jones and Roosevelt converted the RFC's focus from domestic economics to global defense. And it built the enormous plants that would manufacture the ships, trucks, trains, airplanes that were required to fight and win World War II. And it leased them to corporations to operate. Because once again, the federal government through the RFC was the only agency large and powerful enough to address this global situation. One of the things that I think is so important to recognize about the RFC is not just its strategies and policies, which we can adapt today, but also the attitude about government. The, the RFC was almost universally embraced by Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, because they knew it was serving the common good and it was indispensable. So I'm, I'm bringing that up because that is as important as its policies, is our attitude towards the embracing the power of good government. It's the patriotic thing to do, and we can all get behind a new infrastructure bank to do the, the things that need to be done in our great nation. 
So the RFC was, was building these massive plants. They leased them to corporations to operate. And its approach was comprehensive. And again, I'm saying these things because these are models for today. These are successes from the past that we can use for strategies today. It not only built airplanes, it was building, Roosevelt had asked for 50,000 new airplanes a year. And at the time, in 1939, we had 2,500, and most of them were left over from World War I. The Japanese had 8,000 airplanes. The Germans had 8,000 airplanes. We had 25, and everything was antiquated and not really of much use. But everything it did was comprehensive. So it was... it built these enormous plants to manufacture airplanes, but it also cornered the market in silk and wool for parachutes and uniforms. Uh, it, I think one of the most amazing things it did, it created synthetic rubber from the lab to mass production, just in time to field the armed forces for the allies because the Japanese had taken over our supplies of natural rubber during Pearl Harbor, when it took, uh, you know, took over the Pacific, but everything Jones and the RFC did had been basically proactive because they started doing all these things eighteen months before the attacks on Pearl Harbor, and there was enough synthetic rubber to field the armed forces and also to supply domestic needs to a point. Um, but this is all to say these these programs that the RFC did were monumental. They worked. They are proven successes, and we can do the same things today, whether it's spreading broadband access, accumulating strategic materials from around the world that we need, such as rare earth minerals or chips. I mean, all we have to do is look at how did the RFC go from being the 17th in size in the military to being the arsenal of democracy. There's the model. See how it was done. Before that, see how through lending the RFC stabilized and expanded our economy, brought electricity to everybody, just like we want to bring broadband access to everybody. It built bridges, roads, tunnels, aqueducts. What's most amazing about all this during the Great Depression, these gigantic programs made money for the federal government. They did not cost taxpayers one dime. They did not increase the federal deficit. And we need to look at this great option we have today embodied in this bill before Congress to create the same kind of agency that so successfully combated two of our most catastrophic, catas excuse me, catastrophic events during the, the 20th century. Alfaka? That's a great rundown, uh, um, Stephen. Thank you very, very much. And we're going to get into much more details. Uh, but if any of the viewers would like to read those details in Stephen's book, um, the book is online uh, and, and uh, under his website, uh, stephenfenberg.com. And in addition, uh, there's a printed version that you can always get on Amazon if you're the one that likes the paper. Um, but the, the the details uh and the um the the personalities the the kind of complicated infrastructure that they built um the coordination which is what i think is the most interesting thing uh how they recognized where was an emergency need and then they uh, swooped in and uh um you know filled out filled out that gap to make everything work uh, but the beauty of the in institution is, as Stephen said, it made money for government. All the loans were paid back. All the infrastructure worked perfectly. And it was well developed to stimulate the economy and to win the war. So what a great picture that you've painted for us. And we'll get and, into it. And, and to serve the people of the United States. Everybody yes. was benefiting from yes. the activities of the RFC. And I want to make a couple of points, if I may, that I, I, I looked at my notes. What did I forget to say? Uh, <laughs> I want to say that Jesse Jones and the RFC always gave the private sector first choice or first chance to participate in its programs. They had no intention of nationalizing anything. The whole intention of the RFC was to preserve democracy, preserve capitalism, and they gave the private sector every chance they possibly could to participate.
But as I said earlier, most of the issues were so monumental that the federal government was the only agency large enough and powerful enough to address them. But sometimes the private sector was involved and included. If they couldn't be, then the federal government through the RFC stepped in and nobody resented it. You know, it was pretty well universally embraced as as something that was essential. The other point I want to make uh, as we contemplate having a new infrastructure bank, it was operated in a goldfish bowl. It was completely transparent. Jesse Jones would invite reporters to follow him around for a day and see exactly what it took to make this all happen. Um, even during World War II, they, they created an office of information that would distribute the latest in commercial and industrial developments to the public, to corporations, to other government agencies. It was completely transparent. There was never one bit of scandal during Jesse Jones's tenure from 1933 to 1945. It was clean, it was scandal free, and it made money for the United States government and helped everybody. Excellent, yeah. excellent. <laughs> so how about today? Let's just look and see where we are today. What we know is that the RFC had a 20 year sunset clause in it and uh, it wound down its operations and finally unincorporated itself in 1957. What happened after that? What happened after that was we only had really one infrastructure program after that, which was Eisenhower's Highway Trust Fund. And what he did to fund that was he hived off money from a gas tax in the budget to make sure that it would not be misappropriated by any other um, um, activity in the budget. Uh, so it was put into a trust fund. And then he, uh, he funded a, a, a nationwide uh, um, interstate highway system. And of course that had great economic benefits, but now we all know the, high, the ta gas tax is not enough to pay cover for all the roads that we need. And in addition, uh, it's going to, the tax itself will be eaten into the fact that we're going to have electronic, uh, uh, electric vehicles that won't be uh, using gas and that will diminish the gas tax, uh, you know, impetus even further. So that's the only real uh, stimulus that we had. When we had the, the Clean Water Act uh, passed in 1970s under another Republican, Richard Nixon, uh, initially the budget gave a lot of money for the water infrastructure, but over time, all that got cut away. So we have um, unfunded liabilities for water utilities that are supposed to abide by the Clean Water Act, but they have no funding from the government to, to cover this uh, effort. And that's been a very underfunded area of the, of the government. Uh, and other things that we don't cover um, um, include uh, things that the private capital market might, sh might or should be doing, like our electric grid. The, the power companies are pretty much um, owned by private corporations, but also the uh, telecoms. And they aren't uh, making the investments these days that they need to. So let's uh, lo look at where we are with infrastructure. Um, ew, let me pull down my slide here. There we go. So why do we need a national, a new reconstruction finance corporation today? Because we have a huge problem with our infrastructure. Been unfunded essentially since the highway trust fund got started and since the re RFC uh, turned, when, uh, um, turned down its operations in 1957. We have crumbling roads, crumbling bridges, crumbling water infrastructure. Some of our water pipes, our water supply pipes are made of wood. Some of them are over a hundred years old. We still haven't even solved our lead service line problem. Just to show you the backlog of how, how bad it looks, uh, in 2014, uh, 60 Minutes did a special on our, uh, 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 it was a Steve Croft special on the state of our infrastructure and talk about bridges, uh, if, for example, in Pennsylvania that had to have carriages put underneath of them so that the cement parts wouldn't be falling down onto the road below them. Uh, it went on and on. The 60 Minutes rebroadcast that same 2014 special in January of this year. Why did they do that? 
because even though we had the bipartisan infrastructure law, which was supposed to fund and fix infrastructure, it was not enough. And really the state of the infrastructure hadn't changed much. We have traffic and transportation congestion. Our roads have reached their capacity, especially on the East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, airports have reached their capacity. The the you know the the um, the number of airlines airlines coming into airports is e even at a dangerous level. Uh, we have no high speed rail. Other countries around the world use banks like ours to fund their high speed rail projects. And um, I hope Stephen says a little. He since he lives in Holland, I hope he says something about how great it is to ride the trains there, how great it is that they have uh, for a country, 75% of which is below sea level, they have the financing mechanism in place to make sure that all their levies around the uh, the the country uh, are in good working condition uh, because for them it's an existential risk if any of them should break. Our, we have a housing crisis in the United States, especially for low income families. Since COVID, uh, housing rents have just escalated. Uh, homelessness has uh, increased to an all time high. Uh, people are in uh, only a paycheck away from getting evicted. They're working in two or three low service jobs. They need both help on the uh, having a good job uh, level and also on solving this problem that we do not have enough housing units in our, our country to house everybody. The electricity grid is in crisis. Uh, what, uh, last week, Washington Post wrote, uh, ran an article about the uh, grid, which, which looked like a pants on fire type uh, article. It was talking about how AI and serve, uh, um, uh, far server farms are going to be soaking up a lot more demand. Uh, of course, we have climate change and very high temperatures now, uh, record temperatures all across the country. That's uh, using a lot of air conditioning um, uh, demand. And if we, what, if we want to electrify rail, take other things, electrify vehicles, that will also increase demand. And we don't even have enough transmission capacity to move the renewable solar and wind that's coming online right now. It's waiting in line to plug into the grid. Uh, so all that needs to be worked on. We are behind on technologies that could save on energy, uh, resiliency uh, because of climate change, uh, our um, infrastructure is more subject to damage from uh, storms and that kind of thing. And we have a lack of coordination among the different components of infrastructure. So we, what we want to aim to do is to build more dense housing next to a transit station so we can get people back and forth to work. And that uh, coordination is lacking, something that the RFC was able to do. Uh, and this uh, new bank will be able to do it as well. Finally, we have a budget crisis. We have high national debt, now $34 trillion or 126% of GDP. We see what the chaos is causing uh, in the budget negotiations. We haven't even agreed fully on a budget for this fiscal year that started last October uh, because there is only a small slice uh, that the congressman uh, persons have to argue over how much are we going to spend. All the rest of it is mandatory spending. Even though we have economic growth around 2% a, a year, not too bad right now, uh, we're still running a large deficit from one and a half to two trillion a year. We're going to go up exponentially on the debt side. In addition, we have high interest rates while the Fed is trying to tamp down on inflation. That adds to the national debt because now we have to pay more interest on the debt. We need an off-budget institution to finance infrastructure and remove all the excess financing that we need off of the budget. Let the budget continue to um, operate as it has uh, for financing, say, roads or those kinds of things. But to do all the rest of it, uh, we need the National Infrastructure Bank. So. The great news is that today we have estimates on how much do we need from the American Society of Civil Engineers. Every few years they come out with a new report card. They uh, track how old the schools are, how old the bridges are, what's past its light, useful lifetime, what needs to be repaired. And then they come up with an estimate of how much additional money do we need? 
And this is what they say we need to repair our transportation systems, $1.2 trillion, water systems, $1.1 trillion, upgrade the electric power grid. And this is probably way underestimated uh, because it hasn't taken into account this new demand that's coming uh, to light uh, from the Washington Post article. We It, it does not even include estimates for rebuilding a high-speed rail network all across the country that could speed up our transportation, uh, put broadband into rural areas where telecoms do, don't want right now to build it, affordable housing. We need at least 7 million new affordable housing units for the very lowest income earners around the country. We have to stop this, um, you know, putting people on the streets and uh, kids can't even go to school because their housing situation is in chaos. And then we have to worry about our food supply. If we don't take care of our food supply and making sure that it has adequate water, you will really see spiking food prices in the grocery store, unlike what we have seen before. So our bank will cover all of those things it will provide a long-term source of financing and planning, and we can fill in the emergency gaps when we uh, don't when we don't have supply chains to provide the construction inputs for these kinds of things. Yeah, those are all the things that the National Infrastructure Bank can work on. So right now, I'd like to go to the question and answer period. Uh, and um, if if you have any questions that you would like to ask of Stephen about how the uh, RFC worked in the past, how it can work again today, uh, please raise your hand and I'll try and call on you one at a time. And if I may add something to Alfeco's remarks, I, I was kind of smiling when that graphic was up there because every single thing that you are promoting the RFC did except for broadband access only because it didn't exist back then. But everything that you mentioned, the RFC successfully did at no cost to taxpayers and with no increase to the federal debt. Super duper. So we have Don Siefkis from California. Um, uh, Don is one of our coalition members and workers and uh, uh, Don unmute and uh, pose your question for Stephen. Okay, uh, Stephen, I, I have two questions for you. Uh, one, I understand really well how the new proposal, H.R. 4052, will be capitalized. But I, I read your book. I still don't quite understand how the RFC received its initial funding to make these loans. Where did that initial funding for the RFC come from? That's my number one question. And number two, we've had a lot of trouble uh, trying to get a Republican to sign on to this thing, which is unfortunate. I'd like to know your opinion on who the most receptive Republican in Congress, in your opinion, would be for mm. us to really go after that person. It's a really serious question. It, it is a serious question, and it's a huge problem. And that's why I was so clear about saying that Herbert Hoover started the RFC. It was universally embraced by both parties for the most part. Um, and if you notice on the cover of my book, there the cover endorsement is by former Secretary of State James Baker, and yeah. it's over the picture of two Democrats. So it's a very hard question to answer. Um, I wish I, I could tell you who to go to, who would be receptive to this. All we can do is tell them the facts and the truth, and hopefully that will register with some of them. We'll see. Maybe Mitt Romney, maybe the people who uh, seem to be more moderate would be receptive to it. But it should have bipartisan appeal because it does what Republicans used to want to do, is not increase the deficit. But of course, it is big government and people don't seem to like that too much. And that's why I'm also saying that it's something we have to embrace. We have to change our attitude about government. It is not the enemy. For instance, Jesse Jones said in 1937 during one of his many radio broadcasts about economic recovery, it cannot occur if we allow ourselves to think that our government is our enemy. So I think that is fundamental is to change the idea of government. What do we think about government? We should embrace it patriotically. Um, but to your first question, 
uh, as far as I can, you know, recall, the money came from the United States Treasury. Jesse Jones went to the uh, Congress, I think, 13 or 14 times for appropriations when they needed more money. Uh, he was never once turned down. Every time he went to Congress for an appropriation, they gave it to him because they knew they'd get it back. And everything that the uh, the treasure that came out of the Treasury during the Great Depression, not during World War II, but during the Great Depression, everything that the Treasury had allocated to the RFC was returned to it with a profit. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for uh, reading next... my book. Yeah. <laughs> It's a fabulous book. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous. Uh, next up, we have Nelson Bet Betancourt. Could you say where you're from and uh, then post your question? Sure. Uh, Orlando, Florida. Uh, Stephen, I have your book. I haven't finished it yet. Fantastic, what I've read so Thank far. You. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, my, my question is, being that uh, the business people would have a very big interest in this, wouldn't it make sense for us to maybe go to these big business people that really understand the necessity of this, because the, the politicians tend, sometimes tend to follow the 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 the, the business people. Well, you of know? course, they do because they're the ones who fund their campaigns. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, might not it be part of our uh, strategy to go and also get these big business people that can understand this more readily and and begin to kind of see that that ground. Uh, to get the politicians to open up to it, especially the Republicans. It, yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. And another reason why the RFC is such a great model, because its chair was a capitalist. And when you used to have to fill out, you know, your occupation on uh, voter registration things, he would mm -hmm. list himself as a capitalist. And he was. Mm -hmm. he, he was Houston's preeminent developer. He owned the largest newspaper, the largest bank in town, built all the tallest buildings in town, and some in New York City as well. Mm -hmm. So he was a capitalist. And, and the last line, oh, I shouldn't give away the last line of my book since you haven't finished it yet. But <laughs> what I say is that he kept his eye on the bottom line and on the common good, both mm -hmm. as a capitalist and as a public servant. So to me, in answer to your question, he's the model. He he was a capitalist. He was a businessman who understood the value of nurturing one's community because he would prosper if everybody thrived. And that exactly. was whether it was local, national, or international. Exactly. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Thank Stephen. you so much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Nelson. Okay, mm -hmm. next up, we have a question from Ingrid Clare. You have to unmute Ingrid and... Say where you're from, too. Hi, I'm from Seattle, Washington. And um, it seems to me that Jesse Jones was telling everybody, all the citizens of the United States and getting them kind of excited about it and involved in it. Is there um, some way that we could, because of our lack of funds, we're a volunteer group, um, get some people that are in documentaries or whatever interested in this to fund some kind of um, something that would get people excited so that they could uh, also pressure their uh, congressmen and senators to uh, get it to, to vote for this to get involved with it what it what kind of idea do you have on that uh, well, I'm going to let Alfeca answer that from uh, from the coalition's point of view. Uh, but as far as the documentary film goes, I made one. Uh, it's called Brother, Can You Spare a Billion? The Story of Jesse H. Jones. And it tells the story of the RFC and what it did. Uh, it was narrated by Walter Cronkite, who's, you know, who could be more credible if you know who he was, you know, a, the younger generation. I say, oh, my film was narrated by Walter Cronkite. And they said, who's that? But anyway, uh, there is a film available that can show that can tell the story. Uh, but I hear what you're saying. We need to market the coalition's bank. Uh, and and I keep going back to this idea of being patriotic to me, it would be the patriotic thing to do. It would allow us to rebuild our nation without putting us further in debt. Who wouldn't want that? Uh, and there are so many pressing needs. I mean, I, I hear what Alfeca is saying about electricity. We're going to need more 
electricity and we're going to need a grid that can handle it all. The RFC did all of that stuff. Everything that Alfeca is talking about has been done before successfully. So it is a matter of telling the story and I think also couching everything in patriotism because this is to rebuild our nation. And who wouldn't want to do that? And Stephen, okay. maybe you could say something else about how it promoted businesses and jobs, because uh, those are the local things that people care a lot about. Um, and uh, when you construct uh, infrastructure that uh, that's publicly uh, um, built, uh, then that has spinoffs uh, for um, great paying jobs and also for uh, the growth of businesses to do all the construction inputs uh, that are needed for uh, the, the the infrastructure improvements. Uh, I would be glad to because I, I'm always amazed at how we won World War II. When I say that the federal government came in and they built the enormous plants that manufactured everything that was required to fight and win World War II. At the end of the war, it owned 70% of the aviation industry, 100% of the synthetic rubber industry, the majority of magnesium, aluminum, steel. It was owned by the RFC because it built it. But then, it was always its intention to do what they called reconversion. They started planning this way before uh, we won the war, that they needed to transfer this massive ownership into the private sector, which is exactly what happened at the end of World War II. And it, it expanded the middle class. In Houston, where I live, the population doubled between 1940 and 1950. It went from about 400,000 to 800,000 mainly because those synthetic rubber plants had been located along the Texas Gulf Coast, not but not to give Houston an advantage where Jesse Jones was from, because it was the safest place to do it. And it wasn't on the Pacific or the Atlantic, uh, and they had plenty of supply of oil. But that's the answer to the question is to, again, embrace government. When I hear people talk about socialism and that big government is socialism, I cringe because I think, how do they think World War II was won? The United States government built the factories that created everything that was required to, to win the war and leased them to corporations to operate. If we tried to do that again today, it would be denigrated as socialism rather than as good government. And that's why I keep going back to this thing. We have got to change our attitude about the power, the positive power of good government. Excellent. Okay, next up, how about Marty Tallarico? Marty, can you unmute and say where you're from as well? Yes, thank you, Alpeca. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Marty Tallarico from Seattle, Washington. I'm part of, um, also part of Washingtonians for Public Banking. I spent 30 years in finance. Was, our company was bought out by a big bank. It went from good to bad to ugly. I lost my job. That's how I found the Public Banking Institute, and it's given me great hope. But one of my great fears is, and I've, I've read your book, I've seen the documentary, I love I love everything about it, I refer to a lot of people, and um, I encourage everyone to, to get the book and share it as well. Uh, one of my fears, and this is, a, is, is more of a forward-looking looking question, um, our country, as everyone knows, has had, or should know, we've had four uh, national public banks in our nation's history. But all four of them, if I'm not mistaken, had a 20-year sunset clause. My question is this, um, what can we be doing now, if anything, possibly to ensure that through, once this bill goes through Congress and goes through the what's called the sausage making process, what can we do to ensure, all knowing that infrastructure needs don't only don't last for just 20 years, how can we ensure that this bill is enacted with no sunset clause whatsoever. Because I know uh, the public banking sector is very adamantly opposed to public banking. Um, they're gonna do, we have, we're, we have formidable forces out there. So how can we best prepare for them to ensure that this is a multi-generational um, you know, effort and it's not uh, the, the sunset clauses is, is, are not allowed in the in the final bill. Thank I you would for like for, uh, for, Alf for taking this. 
Oh, yeah, and thank you, you for your nice comments about my book and film. That means a lot to me. <laughs> uh, I'm going to let, I want Alfeca to answer this as well. Uh, I think that she would be better at doing it, but part of what will be required is leadership that we can trust that's honorable. And that, that to me is why the RFC was so successful because they had somebody uh, like Jesse Jones, who the nation eventually started calling Uncle Jess because, you know, they trusted him so much and he was without scandal. Uh, and like I said, operated in a goldfish bowl. I think transparency is so imp important when we approach something like this because of the vast sums of money that are involved and what could happen uh, if it's not handled correctly. The RFC actually evolved from what it was into the Small Business Administration. And it's a shame that SBA has not been used more aggressively to do some of the things that we are discussing today. Uh, but the RFC during Jones's tenure from, you know, throughout the Great Depression and World War II was operated in a goldfish bowl and without scandal. After he left office, it kind of deteriorated and he would even testify before Congress, the RFC needs to be closed down. It has served its useful purpose. I think there is something to be said for having a perpetual agency, but there's also something to be said for having a limit once it has served its useful purpose. I don't see a bank like this ever outliving its useful purpose, uh, but the RFC did because it had built up so much and transferred it into the private sector that it really wasn't needed anymore, except for small businesses that needed a loan, what they couldn't get maybe from a commercial bank. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, and I think Alfeca could probably answer it better. I can compliment that a little. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is that what this bank is financing today uh, is a, a permanent source of financing to top up what's needed for public infrastructure. Public infrastructure is something that doesn't ever, you know, eventually get privatized. Uh, so we need a long-term source of fi financing and planning for public infrastructure. What will help us is actually, there are certain pieces of legislation already in place that we can make an argumentation on. The one that uh, uh, I have in mind is the Government Corporations Act under which the National Infrastructure Bank would be incorporated. The Government Corporations Act uh, oversees government corporations that are wholly government owned or partially government owned. This one will be a partial uh, government owned institution because it has investments made into it from the private sector. So it's a mixed ownership. And like the others that are in that category, they have certain features. They have no sunset clause, they have a government guarantee, uh, and they do not require, you know, bu prior budget approvals or anything like that, which would, and they don't take any appropriations from the budget. So that's exactly what this NIB will be, will, will, will uh, be like. And so we can make the argumentation that like those other cor uh, mixed ownership government corporations, and the biggest example of one is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which is owned by the commercial banks uh, and uh, does not make calls usually on the federal government. So we can make the argumentation that uh, like those other government corporations, we do not need to have a sunset clause. Uh, and then I would also uh, point out that um, the the, we do need a long-term source of financing. We, we've seen the problem with the federal budget. Uh, it is in a structural disarray right now. Uh, and if, if, we, if we haven't learned the lesson of the previous four banks, we need a permanent institution to fund public infrastructure. Thank you very much. Appreciate Super. it. Super. Okay, let's go to, uh, I saw... Um... Uh, another name up here, but she's gone away. Um, oh, how about Glenn Ryling? Uh, Glenn, could you unmute and pose your question, say where you're from? Yes, uh, thanks for your time there, Stephen. I found it very informative. Um, my question is this, as, as a member of uh, the Northwest Ohio Passenger Rail Association, um, the question I had is how did the RFC 
prioritized infrastructure jobs. I mean, when it came to passenger rail over roads, how did they, what was the uh, prioritization and how did they, uh, uh, how did that figure into their decision making? Uh, I wish I had a good answer for you, but I don't think they prioritized things. There was so much need. And I mean, we needed the rails were in bankruptcy and they were the largest taxpayers back then. So the RFC had to jump in and help them refinance their debt, which they did. That was one of the great things that they did. They they uh, competed with banks who were trying to charge them way too much interest, and the RFC said, "Uh-uh, we'll come in at four percent if you if you don't come down to a more reasonable rate." Everything they did, it, it, they had so much they had to address because. It was a catastrophe. So I don't know that they prioritized one thing over the next. They could see a need. They could see a way that they could help people and reinvigorate the economy. The railroads were were one of the toughest nuts to crack uh, because they were so deeply in debt. So they said, if you're going to get an R, and also, you know, there were qualifications to get an RFC loan, which I think we need to take a look at today. If a railroad came to the RFC for a loan, Jesse Jones said, well, where do you live? And if they said New York next to their Wall Street banker, but their rail was in California, he says, well, then you need to live by your line, not by the bank. Uh, he limited how much salary they could take uh, and said, you know, Roosevelt said, I want them to earn no more than the president of the United States. And Jesse Jones said, that's not enough. <laughs> and so... He had a higher limit, but if the if a railroad wanted to come to the RFC, they had to meet certain qualifications to do it. So I don't think that they prioritized roads over railroads. I think it was all massively in need. And where they ever saw a need where they could, could go with these lending programs to build a bridge or a tunnel or develop high-speed trains, which is what they did. I mean, the Chicago, Illinois Green Diamond is a great example of the latest in high-speed trains back then that the RSC financed. And they got a lot of publicity for it. And I so I can't really answer your question about how did they prioritize because Everything was a priority back then. Uh, and just as it is today, there are so many things that need to be done. It's kind of hard to pick and choose which is what is more important than the next thing. Maybe Alfeca has a, a response to that. I think that's a great, you, you, you've hit it on the nail. Uh, like I said, we have the uh, estimates from the engineers who are looking at what we need. Uh, back then, uh, it was just intuitive uh, for them, but they 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 saw extreme poverty in Tennessee and uh, the Tennessee Valley area, for example, that was even uh, large poverty by depression standards. And they said, let's ki kill two birds with one stone. Let's tame the Tennessee uh, River. Uh, let's build uh, uh, electricity production off of that, uh, build dams there and put people to work. And they raised the whole living standards at the same time. So it was just, it was great. Within two years, they had infrastructure projects in every county in America, every county, they did not miss one. So if it, and they would look around what needs to be built, new schools, new hospitals, new uh, libraries, new office buildings, whatever, you know, they could build, which added to the productivity of the area. So, but the electrification was really spot on. Uh, you took on a big mammoth thing by electrifying 80% of the country that didn't have it before. So, uh, and the productivity that came out of that, farmers were able to buy pumps to pump water, uh, to milking machines for their cows. They're, as Stephen mentioned, their, their output quadrupled. I mean, that's a, a clear example of how building infrastructure that is a public need, people need it, businesses need it, and uh, winds up growing the economy at the same time and putting people into great paying jobs. Great examples. Thank you. So, Thank you for Craig, your answer. Yeah. Craig Schwartz. Uh, Craig, unmute and say where you're from. Oh, I'm from Northwest Ohio, uh, just about an hour south of where Glenn Reihing uh, resides, um, halfway between Toledo and Columbus. Um, and my, and my, father, Glenn's my father's family came from Findlay, Ohio. Oh, I'm only 15 minutes away. anywhere close to where you are. Yeah, yeah, 15, mm -hmm. 20 minutes down the road from Finland. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Hey, I just wanted to respond to Glenn real quick. Um, I believe that the uh, the emphasis on the highways uh, really came from Eisenhower's administration. Uh, when he was over in World War II and we were finally in Germany, he saw uh, firsthand uh, the Autobahns and how the use of the Autobahns for the military, uh, German military uh, machine, uh, you know, operated and everything. And then when you see those, photos when the allies were marching down the autobahns and we were moving our men and equipment the german pow's were uh in the median there's a couple of famous photographs but one of the things that eisenhower was struck by was the lack of a road system here in the united states that equaled what germany had so he set about uh constructing the national highway system more for defensive purposes and that's how he got it through congress and I think that that was where the emphasis started to go uh, towards highways as a defensive, uh, uh, you know, say, means to get the uh, men and material uh, to and from uh, vast areas. And that's why China, over the last 10 to 15 years, has been expanding their uh, high-speed rail for those same purposes of getting uh, thousands and thousands of troops uh, thousands of miles away at a fast rate. And that's what they've been working on these last 10, 15 years. One of the questions that I actually had, Mr. Fredberg, um, was uh, how do we uh, guard against uh, the banks doing what they did after the great financial uh, recession uh, with the quantitative easing from the Fed and what the Fed, uh, what the federal government did, the Treasury did, a lot of these banks sat on that money. They did not lend it on. It really uh, thwarted our efforts at coming out of that recession. And I think that's one of the reasons why Joe Biden has put his uh, foot on the, on the pedal, because he saw that once you led up like Obama did and TARP didn't do ex everything that it should have done because these banks sat on that money. And that's exactly what happened uh, in 1933. Instead of calling it TARP, Jesse Jones called it the bank repair program. Uh, and the bank sat on the money, primarily because they were shell-shocked and they didn't, you know, they were afraid to lend it. And that's when the RFC really took off because it became the lender of last resort when the banks wouldn't do it. And Jesse Jones gave them every opportunity to participate in all the different programs when they wouldn't pony up. Jesse Jones said then the federal government through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation must be the lender of last resort. And the same thing could happen again today. And I would point out that the uh, the language of the bill uh, for the National Infrastructure Bank also calls itself the lender of last resort uh, mm -hmm. because that's what we are. I mean, the federal budget hasn't done it. The state and local budgets haven't done it. The muni bonds haven't done it. In fact, the muni bond business is going to go down since one of the banks has gotten out of that business. Uh, and uh, we can always, they can always build, the telecoms can always uh, build in a rural area if they want to, but they haven't done it so far. So that's when the National Infrastructure Bank steps in as the la lender of last resort. So let's next up, let's call on Stacy Webb. Stacy, could you unmute and say where you're from? Hi, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. And I want to first thank you so much for your problem solving attitude. Obviously, you are knowledgeable, bright, and energetic. Um, however, given our current political situation. Um, my question is how to accomplish this and what um, what steps do we need to take? I know you, uh, Stephen, have mentioned uh, using the word um, uh, patriotic, and yes, that is very true. Um, and my other question is, have you uh, uh, reached out to red state governors? I would think that all governors would be on on your side, but red state governors in particular would be helpful. I agree. And, and this is a question I think that's better for Alfaka because she's really in the thick of promoting the bank. Uh, but I go back to the idea of patriotism, that, that we should just put everything we can. We should wave the flag because this is something that is good for everybody. It is good for the, it will promote the common good. And uh, I think that is the best way that we can sell it is to change our attitude about the power of good government and yeah. to couch this in patriotic terms. Here is a yeah. way we can save our country and not increase the debt and not burden taxpayers. 
Uh, but as far as outreach goes, that's really Alfeca's uh, baby. So I'll let her please take that uh, question. Yeah, of course, the National Governors Association, we have talked to them. Uh, they uh, are very much interested in, uh, see, uh, they, they've always had a bipartisan approach to promoting infrastructure, that's for sure. Um, they really want to see some Republicans on this bill. Uh, so do we. Uh, we've adopted some of their slogans. Uh, instead of making America great again, we need to make America make again, uh, which we need to reshore American manufacturing. And building this infrastructure will do that because there's a Buy America only program in it. It'll reach all areas of the country because it's large enough. So rural and urban will uh, benefit from this bill. And there's a geographic dispersion clause in there to make sure that uh, funding gets out into si every single region in the country. The ones that are uh, losing their economy are the rural areas. People are uh -huh. leaving from those rural areas because the jobs and what they can earn are not enough. Uh, they're mm -hmm. moving to cities. Right. Cities are becoming overwhelmed. Uh, we need to make sure that we get economic development and infrastructure development into every single district in the country. And that will promote great paying jobs, which will help the people in those areas. So that's kind of the approach and the way we've been selling it. Ingrid, did you have another question? Of course, I always have other questions. I want you to explain, I understand <laughs> it for me, but I want you to explain um, how other kind of out, outside sources will not be able to have access to the the running of the bank, like for instance, mm -hmm. large corporations or you know, a federal, you know, people that want to take money from the bank because there's this big stockpile of money. Can you tell us how we're going to get be protected from that? Thank you. So why don't you start, Stephen, with how well, the I think RFC you're the, I think it. you're the one to answer this. Oh, okay, but how did the RFC do it? Uh, you know, it was pretty simple, straightforward. You know, they would apply for loans if they were credible and credit worthy, they would get a loan. Mm -hmm. uh, the, but as I also said that Jesse Jones and the RFC encouraged the banks to participate with them and to make loans to credit worthy customers. And when they wouldn't do it, the RFC was, like we said, the lender of last resort. There was no other choice, but uh, the RFC that you could not intervene, a bank could not intervene into the operations of the RFC and get money out of it uh, without repaying it, such as it did with the preferred stock program. Um, but I think that, again, you know, you're more in the thick of the, the operations of the new bank. I can talk about the previous one and how it is a model for today. All we all those things that you discussed that you want the new bank to do, the RFC did it and it was successful. Right. So as far as the National Infrastructure Bank is concerned and the, the piece of legislation, the act that is in Congress right now, everything that the NIB will lend for is set out in the bill. So uh, it can't go astray on uh, things that are not covered in the areas of transportation, water infrastructure, the grid, those kind of things. Uh, and as Stephen said, it'll be a, it'll be a simple process. The, any entity that owns this infrastructure can come in and request a loan. They'll have to, will do due diligence on their loan request, uh, just like we do it on a you know a request for a mortgage, a home mortgage. Uh, they should have an economic. It should have a good economic impact in their area. Um, it's easy to make that case for all of the infrastructure. You want to have clean water. You want to have not, you know, good roads that don't have potholes in them. Uh, you want your grid to, you know, your light switches to turn on when you hit the light switch. Uh, and you want to see if you can save on energy and those kinds of things. So all of that is in the bill. It's set out in the bill. And then we'll actually have also engineers, back office engineers, to help these requests for loans, these uh, borrowers uh, mm -hmm. who are asking for loans to formulate their loan request, uh, will be looking to make sure that they uh, appoint good managers for the project. And then when they go out to their, um, through their uh, process of 
procurement to get a contractors to do the building and and that kind of thing uh they should uh they should be also reporting back on how that's going so we'll be watching the progress with the rollout of the loans as well uh so all those are management tools that we learn from the RFC we'll be using them again the board of directors of the of the national infrastructure bank will approve the loans in accordance with the statute and it's all set out in the statute Stacy, did you have another question? I did real fast. Um, the last slide was only up for a few seconds, but it had uh, further information yes. uh, where to go. Could you um, email that to everybody who registered for we this can. program? Yes, you can also go on our website. Uh, eventually, we'll put this recording up on the website on the main page. Uh, that's one of the ways that we've been uh, promoting with excellent webinars like this. And we have lots of um, input from all of our audiences across the country, which we really value. Uh, we will put the video up and the slideshow is already there with all the contact information. NIBcoalition.com oh. is the website. Uh, one more time. NIBcoalition.com. Thank you. but I'll put up the, the final slide then and you can also see. There we go. So uh, I think that's the end of our questions for today and we're now at one hour. I wanna really thank Stephen for this excellent presentation. You, you energize all of us every time you come on. We really, really do thank you. Uh, for all of you folks who are out there, who this is a grassroots effort. We have to go to our members of Congress and say, we need this. We need better jobs. We need better infrastructure for all. Uh, and we can do this. We've done it successfully four times before. Uh, so you can call your member of Congress. You can go on to our website, nibcoalition.com, and get uh, different packages that'll help you, flyers to take. If you go to any of your uh, town hall meetings with legislators in your area, take those flyers along with you. Tell them we have got lots of momentum on this bill. Uh, people are signing up. Uh, you know, Every couple of weeks, we get a new member signing up. We are now at 28 members. We've far exceeded uh, um, our um, sign-ons in Congress compared to the, uh, the last time we introduced. Um, th this has legs, and it's really been on account of the grassroots effort, the local legislators pushing their members of Congress. They know how much need we have. Uh, we are, where our ultimate hope is that they will keep track. They will have a rolling stock of infrastructure projects that have not been able to get funding. And uh, then they can always point to these, a bridge here, a new subway that line that's needed there. Uh, and that they that this is the reason why we need a permanent bank because those in needs will roll over. They'll never go away. We need to keep financing our public infrastructure, making sure that we're 21st century technology with the latest technologies. We need to level out our grid, which is producing energy in different ways now, including at the micro level. And uh, that requires a lot of new technologies, smart grids, smart uh, meters on your house, those kinds of things. We need to improve our rail transportation, get much more uh, transportation onto rail, uh, get housing located near those stations, uh, you know, take care of our uh, lower and middle class uh, folks and get them into great paying jobs, do training. That's not, that's one of the things we haven't talked about too much, but uh, a lot of training went on. Stephen, maybe you could say something about that. Uh, how well, they would take people that were unemployed, 25% unemployment, put them into camps, uh, have them earn while they learn. And then at nighttime, they were in in, in classes to learn, uh, you know, top up their skills. Could you say something about that? Well, also in aviation, like I said, everything they did was comprehensive. So not only were they building the airplanes, creating the rubber for the tires, the, the silk for the parachutes, they had they were building 50,000 airplanes a day and nobody knew how to fly them. So they created flight schools to train pilots to fly the airplanes. Mm -hmm. right. That's what I'm saying. Everything was comprehensive. They would see the need and what all was surrounding that and just didn't isolate one little thing. They did everything that was required. And education was certainly part of that effort, uh, specifically during World War II, 
to train pilots. I mean, that that's just a great example of all the different things the RFC as an infrastructure bank was able to do. Excellent. Do you have anything you wanted to add on, uh, you know, ideas for people to help out and, you know, uh, push this notion forward? No, I mean, I think I think these webinars are just a great way to inform people about the promise of this bank that we could show them. This was all done before. It's not rocket science. It was done during the Great Depression and World War II, which weren't all that long ago. And I'd say, you know, talk to your elected officials, talk to your friends and family, let them know that something like this is a possibility uh, to renew our nation with no new debt and no new taxes. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Stephen. Really appreciate it. And thank you to all of you for attending today. And uh, as I said, check out our website and we'll put this uh, video up. If you, if uh, somebody that you know wasn't able to watch uh, uh, this morning, then they can see the, the video a little bit later. So thanks very much to all of you for your for coming today. Really appreciate it. Okay. <laughs>